Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In analyzing the great dua of Al Joshan Al Kabir, we realized that this dua is a beautiful dua that enables us to reconnect to Allah Azza wa Jal. And likewise, it enables us to better understand our Creator, our Lord, to understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus you found the forgiveness of Allah azza wa jal that we showed the different levels as seen in Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir. Tonight I'd like to move on and analyze another Dua that has the same name. It, it is also called Dua al-Jawshan. But many of us are not familiar with it. Many of us maybe have not heard of it, or if we've heard of it, we have not read it, or if we have read it, we have not understood it. If you open the book of Al-Mafatih, Mafatih Al-Jinan, you will find two du'as with the name of Al-Jawshan. The first is Dua Al-Jawshan Al-Kabir, and that is the one we spoke about last night. It's the one we recite in the nights of Laylat Al-Qadr. And then you will find another Dua of Al-Jawshan, another Dua of Al-Jawshan called Dua Al-Jawshan Al-Saghir. What's the difference between Jawshan Al-Saghir and Jawshan Al-Kabir? The difference between them is that they both provide protection. Because remember we said Joshan means armor, provides protection for you. But the difference is Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir is number one much longer and thus it's called Kabir. Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir, it's much shorter and thus it's called Saghir. And number two, Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir, it provides general protection from all harms. Whether the harms of the dunya or the harms of the akhirah as we mentioned. While Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir is used to protect you from the harm of an enemy that you have. If you have any enemy that is causing you trouble, that is oppressing you, then this is the time to recite Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir. Because in the end, you invoke the wrath and the curse of Allah on that enemy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you over your enemy. This is Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir. So I'd like to analyze Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir tonight insha'Allah so that we can better appreciate it and understand it. Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir is narrated from Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam the seventh Imam of Ahlul Bayt. Why did the Imam recite this Dua? There's a story behind it. It was during the Khilafah of Musa al-Hadi. Who's Musa al-Hadi? He is the brother of Harun al-Rashid. The Khalifa before Harun was Musa al-Hadi. It is the Khilafah of Musa al-Hadi. Because of the government of Bani al-Abbas became very oppressive. And they began to spread tyranny. One of the descendants of Al-Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam by the name of Al-Husayn ibn Ali. He decided to revolt just like his uncle Imam Hussein. He has the same name, Hussein ibn Ali, as of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He revolts with about a hundred men, hundred companions, similar to the story of Imam Hussein. He revolts against the Khalifa of the time, Bani al-Abbas, and he what? He is killed. Not only is he killed, the one hundred men with him are killed, and their heads are severed and placed on what? They are placed on the spears and his women are taken as war prisoners. Exactly the story that we read, that, the, we, that we know about Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, happened to Al Hussein ibn Ali, the Shaheed of Fakh, because that is where he was massacred. Imam Hussein was massacred in Karbala. He is the Shaheed of Karbala. Al Hussein ibn Ali is the Shaheed of Fakh. That you find that Imam al Rada alayhi salam says in one hadith, if it, if it was not for Imam Hussein in Karbala, the greatest tragedy for Ahlul Bayt was the tragedy of Fakh. So after Al Hussein ibn Ali, the Shaheed of Fakh, is killed, Al Musa al Hadi, the Khalifa, he is now in rage, he's angry. Who does he accuse and blame behind this revolution? Al Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam. He accuses Al Imam al Kadhim of being behind this revolution and he is the one that motivated Al Hussein ibn Ali Shaheed Fakh. He is the one that instigated them. So, what does he decide? He decides to secretly assassinate Al Imam al Kadhim. He secretly makes up 
a very evil plan. He devises a plot, a plan to secretly assassinate Imam al kazim alayhi salam. While he is making that plan, Ali ibn Yaqtin, he notices and he realizes that this plan is what? Against Imam al kazim Ali ibn Yaqtin was one of the Shia of Imam al kazim I'll speak more about him the subsequent night. And he was inside the government of Bani al-Abbas doing taqiyya. Ali ibn Yaqtin hears that there is this secret plan to kill Imam al kazim What does he do? He quickly sends a letter to Imam al kazim informing him that al Musa al-Hadi is devising a secret plan to assassinate you. So be careful, Ya ibn Rasulullah. The ahadith say that Imam al kazim alayhi salam quickly turned to Allah Azza wa Jal and he recited Dua al-Jawshan الصغير. After he recited Dua al Joshan al Sagir, it's reported that that same night he saw Rasulullah, the seventh Imam, saw Rasulullah in his dream, and the Prophet told him that do not worry, do not fear Musa al Hadi because Allah will take him down in a few days. Subhanallah, only two, three days passed, Musa al Hadi died, and Harun became the next Khalifa, and thus it became a Sunnah of the followers of Imam al kazim the followers of Ahlul Bayt, anytime there is an oppressive enemy, there is someone that you fear, you recite Dua al joshan al-Kabir, and you invoke the wrath of Allah on that enemy, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from that enemy. Where do we find Dua al joshan al-Saghir? Dua al joshan al-Saghir, the earliest book that cites and mentions this Dua, is the book of Muhajud Da'awat. Muhajud Da'awat is a book that was compiled by a Sayyid ibn Tawus. A Sayyid ibn Tawus was the grandson of a Shaykh al Tusi, Shaykh al Ta'ifa. One of the greatest ulama of the Shia school of thought is a Shaykh al Tusi. He is the founder of the Hawza of Najaf 1000 years ago. A Shaykh al Tusi had a grandson by the name of a Sayyid ibn Tawus. He was not his son's son. He was his, the son of his daughter. That's why he was Sayyid and a Shaykh al-Tusi was Shaykh, if anyone's wondering. A Sayyid ibn Tawus was one of our also greatest ulama. Sayyid ibn Tawus, one of the things that he did is that he would compile the ahadith that contained dua. Any dua one of the imams recited, he would compile them and he finally published a book called Muhajud Da'awat and he has other books about dua as well. In this book, Muhajud Da'awat, he narrates dua al Joshan al Sagir from one of the companions of Imam al Kazim by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd. Now, contrary to dua al Joshan al Kabir, we said. That Dua al Joshan al Kabir is Mursal, if you remember, meaning there's a missing link between Al Kafami and Al Imam Zain al Abidin. We don't know who the narrator is, the chain of narrators between Al Kafami and Al Imam Zain al Abidin, it is unknown for us. But what makes Dua al Joshan al Sagir unique is that it is Musnad. As Sayyid ibn Tawus told us exactly how he received this hadith from Al Imam al Kazim alayhi salam. So he says in his book, Muhajud Da'awat, this Dua. Of Al Joshan al Sagir, I narrate it from my grandfather, Al Shaykh al Tusi. Al Shaykh al Tusi narrates it from four people. So he had four sources. All of them, they were narrating Dua al Joshan al Sagir. One of those four was Ibn al Ghadairi. Ibn al Ghadairi was one of the most esteemed ulama of Rajal that we have that he had written books on the different narrators and are they trustworthy or are they not reliable. So, a Sayyid ibn Tawus from a Shaykh al Tusi, his grandfather. Shaykh al Tusi from four narrators, one of them being Ibn al Ghadairi. These four narrators from a Shaybani, a Shaybani from Abu al Wadhah, Abu al Wadhah from Abdullah ibn Zayd. Abdullah ibn Zayd was one of the companions of Imam al Kab. So the hadith says, Abdullah ibn Zayd says <clears throat> that it was a custom that the Ashab of Imam al Kazim alayhi salam. They would gather every day to see Al Imam Al Kazim alayhi salam. To see him, they would gather because remember, this is before 
the uh, Khulafa of Bani al-Abbas, they made the life of Imam al-Kadhim very difficult and they persecuted him. And I will mention this in a few days, inshallah, when I speak about taqiyya, of how the life of Imam al-Kadhim became a life of difficulty from the authorities, that the Imam had no freedom to teach. But this was in the early stages, before they had persecuted Imam al-Kadhim, he still had some freedom. Abdullah ibn Zayd says, it was a custom. The companions of Imam al-Kadhim and some of his relatives, they would gather every day in the majlis of the Imam, and the Imam would speak, he would teach. He would teach his companions about fiqh, about the laws of halal and haram. He would teach them about theology, aqa'id. He would teach them tafsir of Quran. He would teach them akhlaq. So it was a majlis that the seventh Imam had every day, and his followers would attend and they would learn. Abdullah ibn Zayd, he says, when we would come, we would hide a pen and paper in our sleeves. Why? Because you would not want to be caught narrating a hadith from Imam al-Kadhim. Time of taqiyya. I'll speak more about that inshallah in a couple of days. He says, we would all hide a piece of paper and pen so that every time the Imam would speak, we would write it down. Some people think the ahadith that we have now, it's all the narrators would hear and they would memorize and then they would narrate it to others. No, most of the ahadith, they were written down. As soon as Imam al-Sadiq would say something, the narrators would write it down. As soon as Imam al-Kadhim would say something, the narrators would write it down. As soon as Imam al-Rida alayhi salam would speak, you have cer certain occasions where hundreds of narrators would all be ready to write one hadith of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. And we have an example that happened in Nisabur. When Imam went to Khurasan, he stopped in Nisabur and they told him to tell us a hadith from your grandfather. He told them the silsila al-dhahabiyya, the hadith of where Rasulullah says, La ilaha illallah hisni man dakhala hisni amina min adabi. The hadith says that there were hundreds Hundreds of narrators all, they had their papers and their pens ready to write the hadith of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. So Abdullah ibn Zayd says, anytime Imam al-Kadhim would speak, we would take out the piece of paper, we would write, and then we would hide it back in our sleeves. <clears throat> he says, one day we noticed Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, he started to do shukr. He started to thank Allah azza wa jal. And then the Imam began to recite a dua that we had never heard before. So because this is a new dua, everyone in that gathering, they took out their pen and paper and they began to write this beautiful dua. The Imam began to say, Ilahi kammin aduwin intada alayya sayfa adawata. And then he continued in what is now known to be dua al-jawshan al sagheer So Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, recited this dua, and many of his companions, they narrated it, and then it was passed from generation to generation until a Sayyid ibn Tawus, he compiled it in his book, and we have the book of Muhajj al-Da'wa, it's available now. Now, Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, he recited the dua of al-Jawshan al-Kabir, why? Because we said Musa al-Hadi was out after the Imam to kill him. So obviously in the end he invoked the wrath of Allah against Musa al-Hadi the Khalifa. Abdullah ibn Zayd says, we finished the dua with the Imam, we prayed salah jama'ah. He says the next time we came and we had our jalsa, we had our gathering with the seventh Imam in the middle of the jalsa, someone brought news that Musa al-Hadi has died. Subhanallah, how quickly Allah Azza wa Jal answered the dua of Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. And that's why, as I said, it became a sunnah. The followers, the companions, they noticed that anytime you have an enemy, this enemy is causing you any trouble, go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recite dua al-Jawshan al sagheer and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you victorious over your enemy. So this is the dua of al-Jawshan al sagheer Now I'd like to analyze the content of this dua. What does this dua contain? Now I'm just going to... Analyze it one night. So just a brief overview of Dua al-Jawshan al sagheer So Abdullah ibn Zayd, he says, we noticed the Imam began with this line. He said, the Imam said this. This is how Dua al-Jawshan begins. Ilahi, kemmin aduwin intada alayya sayfa adawatih, wa shahada li dhubata midyatih. He says, we noticed the Imam began to speak to Allah and he told him, Ya Allah, 
You know how many enemies I have. These enemies have taken out the sword of their venom, the sword of their evil, and they are just waiting to strike me. Because what? Musa al-Hadi is plotting against the Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. So he says, Ilahi, kam min aduwin intada alayya sayfa adawata. Wa shahada li dhubata midyata. You know how many enemies I am surrounded by. These enemies are conspiring against me. These enemies are trying trying to take me down. These enemies are trying to defeat me. So this is on one side. The Imam spoke about how he has enemies and the enemies are trying to conspire against him. But then the Imam, he moves on to the second point. After that, the Imam says, but you, Ya Allah, have not left me. You have not forsaken me. فَأَيَّتَّنِي بِقُدْرَتِكْ وَنَصَرْتَنِي وَنَصَرْتَنِي بِعَزِّكْ فَأَيَّتَّنِي بِقُدْرَتِكْ وَشَدَدْتَ أَزْرِي بِنُصْرَتِكْ From one side, Ya Allah, I have so many enemies that are trying to take me down and defeat me. But from the other side, I have you, Ya Allah, with me to protect me, to defend me, to support me, to guard me against their evil. And subhanAllah, this is a dua that I think every one of us can relate to. And that I think every one of us, we've went through times in our lives where we've had certain enemies who want us to fail. Sometimes it's because what? Sometimes it's because of envy. Some people envy you because you're successful. Yes, they have hasad. They direct the evil eye against you. And they try to plot against you because they don't want you to be successful. They try to plot against you. They try to conspire against you. You will hear that they held a majlis against you. They're trying to defame you. They're trying to tarnish your reputation. They're trying to tell people in the community that you are no good, that you are this, instilling fear in people's hearts against you. Or for example, they're trying to discourage people from befriending you, from coming to see you, from coming, for example, to the masjid or the Husayniya that you serve in. I'm sure every single one of us has a story about that. Enemies that are trying to conspire against us. And sometimes... These enemies are conspiring against us and we have no idea. We are sleeping, we don't know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not sleep. Allah azza wa jal protects us because Allah azza wa jal can see these evil individuals and how they're trying to take you down, how they're trying to make you fail. Allah azza wa jal is there to protect you. Many times, brothers and sisters, we begin to lose hope. We see enemies that are more in numbers than us. They are more powerful than us. They may have more resources than us. They are filled with hate, with venom, with animosity, and they have sinister plans against us. You begin to lose hope. How will I prevail against these enemies? Al Imam al Kadhim and Dua al Joshan al Sagir reminds us that remember you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have Allah, all you need is Allah azza wa jal. You don't need anything else. Wallahi, you do not need lawyers. You do not need money. You do not need supporters. You do not need anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says in Dua. He says, Ilahi, ma wajada man faqadak. What has he gained? The one that doesn't have Allah. You see, those enemies, they think that they have everything. They have money. They have the numbers. They're shrewd. They use these evil tactics against you. Sometimes the tactics that even the shaitan himself is puzzled at. They have everything, but they don't have Allah. They lack Allah. The Imam says, these people have nothing. And then the Imam says, وَمَا الَّذِي فَقَدَ وَمَاذَا فَقَدَ مَنْ وَجَدَكِ And the one that has nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has no money, no supporters, he does not have anyone to help him, but he has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Imam says this person has everything. So Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam in Dua al-Jawshan al-Saghir reminds us that if you have an enemy, even if that enemy sometimes could be living in your own house, this person is abusing you in your own house and he's taking advantage of you and you have no one to support you. Know that Allah Azza wa Jal is there. So the Imam then continues and then he says, فَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ يَا رَبِّي مِنْ مُقْتَدِرٍ لَا يُغْلَبْ وَذِي أَنَاتٍ لَا يَعْجَلْ So I praise you, you are Allah. I praise you, Ya Allah, for two things. Number one, you are مُقْتَدِرٍ لَا يُغْلَبْ You are powerful, Ya Allah. 
You are more powerful than all my enemies. No matter how much might they have and money and power, Allah Azza wa is more powerful. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is the most powerful. So this is number one. And number two, the anat la ya'jal. Allah Azza wa is patient. What does that mean? Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala sometimes he allows the enemy to what? To take his term. He does not defeat your enemy right then in the beginning. Why? Because Allah is wise, he is tolerable and he is patient. Allah wants to test you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes tests us as the Quran says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Where is the test? Every time I have an enemy, I raise my hands. The next day Allah, for example, brings down thunder, fire, and he defeats my enemy. This is not a test. Allah sometimes tests us through our enemies. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya, why ya Allah is this person causing me so much trouble? Why ya Allah do I have so many enemies? Maybe it's because what? Maybe it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to test my patience. So Allah is patient. He may not bring down the nasr. He may not bring down the, big, the victory right then and there. But Allah azza wa jal, in the end, He will make you prevail. After testing you and seeing your patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then help you. So then the Imam says, Salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. And Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The Imam says, so I send my blessings upon Muhammad and his family. Waj'alni ya ilahi, waj'alni li'an'umika min ash-shakirin, aw li'na'ma'ika min ash-shakirin, wa li'ala'ika min ash-shakirin. So make me, ya Allah, what? Make me thank you for all the na'am that you have given me and guide me to always remembering you. Why does the Imam say this? Because like I said many times, Times, brothers and sisters when we are faced with the enemy we lose hope we forget about Allah we forget that there is a Allah a powerful creator that is there to support me and to create you know many people they commit suicide why when they have so many problems in their life because they forget that Allah is there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take you out of the biggest problem no matter how big your problem is it's not bigger than Allah it's not too difficult upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the problem is when we fail in remembering Allah and there is a creator Allah who can save us, this is when we become despondent, we lose hope, we lose faith. And sometimes we may think about what? We may think about suicide. While the one that has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows Allah is there. Yes, sometimes you have to be patient. Allah will test you. There will be difficulties, but in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you triumph. So the Imam says that learn to trust Allah. Anytime you have an enemy, trust Allah azza wa jal, He will protect you. He is the greatest protector and He will not let you down. And me, brothers and sisters, I have a personal story with Dua al-Joshan al sagir This is the first time maybe I'm ever sharing it on a member. I remember a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, one day someone comes to me and he tells me, Sayyid, do you know that for the last couple of months, there is someone in the community who is conspiring against you, trying to destroy your reputation in the community? I had no idea. Like I said, I was sleeping. Sayyid, this person has so much money. He has the best lawyers. This person has supporters. This person is smart intelligence. He is unique. He is using his satanic methods against you. And he has forged documents against you. It's a done deal. There's nothing you can do. It came down like thunder upon me. Wallahi, this is my personal story. And this person was a munafiq. Meaning in the community, people respected him. He was a hajj. And let me even add to it. Not only was he a Hajj, he was a Sayyid. So if he says anything, people would believe him. And he was someone popular in the community that everyone would respect. And he wanted to take down my reputation. Wallahi, I was mazloom in that case. So I thought to myself, what should I do? Who should I go to? Any person I go to, they won't believe me. Because this person is so respectful in the community and he has forged some evidence. He's conspired with other people, paid the money to make false testimonies. I thought to myself, I lost hope. Who do I go to? 
Even my family members, wallahi, I doubted that they would stand with me. And this is when I remembered, I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how shrewd and powerful this man is, he cannot outsmart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He cannot defeat Allah azza wa jalla. And Allah knows that I am mazloom in this case. And I had no idea. I had no idea that this person was even planning this against me. I never even had a problem with this person. So I decided one night to resort to Allah Azza wa Jal. And I remembered this dua, dua al-Joshan al-Saghir. I think this is the only time in my life I have, have read dua al-Joshan al-Saghir. I have read it against someone. Yes, I have studied it. I have read it just to understand it. But if reading it against someone, invoking it against someone, this is the first time I had done it in my life. Because in the end of dua al-Joshan, when you end it, you ask Allah to bring down his punishment, his wrath upon your enemy, and you, may, you mention his name. You mention his name and the name of his father. Nothing against his father, but just to you know, make sure it's a specific person. So don't just say Muhammad and there's a thousand Muhammads, for example. So you say, Allahumma inni adra'u ilayka fi nahri fulan ibn fulan. Ya Allah, I ask you to destroy this person and you mention them. This is the first and only time I had recited Dua al joshan against someone because wallahi, I had no other way out. If I would have told anyone, they would have sided with that person. I needed a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I sat down with khushu and khudu. I turned to Allah and I told him, Ya Allah, you know that I have no one and no one will believe me if I go unless I have to convince so many people because he had brainwashed people to think that this is true. So I sat and I recited this beautiful dua. Ilahi kam min aduan intada alayya sayfa adawatih wa shahada li zubata midyatih. And I continued all of it. I finished that dua. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you how the events began to unfold in my favor in the next couple of weeks. To the extent, Wallahi, alladhi la ilaha illa hu. His own mother stopped talking to him. His own brothers and sisters disavowed him. His own family members, who were the backbone of his supporters, they all disassociated him. They all stopped talking to him. They all considered him as the biggest zalim. And I did nothing. I did nothing. I did not have to mobilize people. I did not have to call fulan and fulan. I did nothing. I just sat down and I watched Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect me and defend me and support me. Wallahi, it is a story that unbelievable how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supports you when you have no one but Allah azza wa jal. A couple of weeks later, he comes to my door. He comes, he wants to kiss my hand and apologize. Wallahi, if I would have spent millions of dollars, I don't think I could have received such a result. How did that happen? Allah azza wa jal. I went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I recited Dua al joshan al-Saghir. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, this is such a powerful dua. I don't know why most people don't use it. Some people, they come, they just complain, complain about this enemy, about this enemy, about this person who's causing them problems in the community, in the household, here, there. Allah Azza wa Jal, the Imams have taught us such a beautiful dua. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim read it on Al-Musa Al-Hadi, he died three days later. And subhanallah, I have read it and I have seen the beautiful Results of it, and I know stories of other people who have recited Dua al joshan al-Saghir and Allah has showed them His power. Allah Azza wa Jal had showed them how He always supports the mazloom. Now, sometimes remember you have to be patient. So don't read it and expect right away because Allah Azza wa Jal wants to test your patience at times. Allah Azza wa Jal wants to see will you go against him will you start to what, lose faith in him or no you will be patient but the point is this is one of the most beautiful du'as of Ahlul Bayt read it brothers and sisters read it and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for the one who goes to him and has no one and you know that's why there's a hadith there's a hadith of Al-Imam Zainul Abideen where he says on the day of Ashura before my father went and he got killed on the day of Ashura, he called me. He says he came in my tent and he gave me the last wasaya, the last wills. Amongst the things that my father, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, told me on the day of Ashura, he told me, Ya waladi, iyaka wa la yajidu alayka nasiran illallah. 
never oppress a weak person that has no one to help them but Allah. Because when you mess with a person that only has Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will now be your enemy. There's people, mashallah, they have lawyers, they have a huge family, a tribe, they have supporters, they have people in the government, correct, to support them and help them. They have so much money. There's others who have nothing. They don't have money, they don't have lawyers, they don't have family members. They are just an average servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam al Hussein tells Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen, of course he's telling the Imam so that the Imam teaches his companions. Do not mess with someone that is all alone and has no one but Allah because Allah Azza wa Jal will now seek revenge against you. So this is the first part of Dua al-Jawshir al-Saghir. The Imam, I just summarize it. The Imam speaks in many beautiful terms about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times we have enemies and we don't even know about them. He defends us in the best possible way. The Imam then transitions to the second part. Dua al-Jawshir al-Saghir is two parts. We can categorize it in two parts. The Imam then transitions to the second part of Dua al joshan al-Saghir. What does the Imam speak about? The Imam then speaks about shukr, about being more appreciative of the na'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being more thankful and ultimately learning to be content in our lives. Because you know this is a problem that many people suffer from. They're not happy with their lives. They live a life of discontent. They're not happy with their salary. They're not happy with their job. They're not happy with their house. They're not happy with their spouse, complaining always about their wives or about their husbands. They're not happy about their school, about their career, about so many things. Everywhere I go, you see people complaining, complaining. You see so many people, they are in depression. And as I said, sometimes the depression leads to people thinking about suicide and even committing suicide. If you go back to the first step, what? It's discontent. Many people are discontent. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam. In Dua Al-Jawshan Al-Saghir, he transitions to teaching us how to be content. The Imam says, Ya Allah, yes, I have many enemies. And these enemies, maybe they are hurting me. Maybe they have, what? They have afflicted me with pain, correct? They are bothering me, they are troubling me. But at the same time, Ya Allah, that I have this problem of my enemy, Alhamdulillah, my life is much better than many other people. Sometimes we just complain and complain and we forget about the good things that we have and we just focus on the problem that we have in our lives. Al Imam Al Kadhim says, Yes, ask Allah to help you with your enemy. Complain to Allah, but at the same time, thank Him for the other na'am. Because if you look around the world, you will see so many people that have a much worse life than you. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care how much you're suffering. There are so many people that are suffering much more than I am. So he teaches us a, a lesson in qana'a. He teaches us a lesson in what? In content. Because many times we cannot change our lives. If you can change your life for the better, do so. But many times we can't change. If you can't change reality, what do you do? You change yourself. Change your perspective. Change yourself and change your qana'a by learning to be content with the things you have in life. And there's a beautiful hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he teaches us how to become qanu'ah, how to become someone that is content, how to learn qanu'ah. The Imam says it's a two-step It's a two -step process. If you want to be content with your life, some people, they're always greedy, they want more and more, they're not happy with their lives. Al Imam al Sadiq says there's two steps. Number one, he says, if you want to learn qana'a, he says, Number one, look at those that have a worse life than you. And this is exactly what Al Imam al Kadhim mentions in Dua, Dua al Joshan al Saghir. The Imam in Dua al Joshan al Saghir. He shows how at the same time that he has an enemy and he's in pain because of the enemy, at the same time, Alhamdulillah, he has so much na'am. His life is still much better than so many other people. And then Imam al Kadhim in Dua al Jawshan, he mentions 15 groups of people that are suffering in ways that he is not. So thank Allah Azza wa Jal for that. He mentions 15 groups as an example. So first he begins, number one, he says, Ilahi wa kammin abdin amsa wa asbaha muja'an saqima. He says, Ya Allah, yes, maybe I have an enemy, but at least I have health. 
How many people? They are what? They are in so much pain because of a health condition that they have. Alhamdulillah, I have health. So thank Allah for health. Don't just complain that I have this problem. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal that you have a healthy body, that you don't have to go constantly to the doctors. You know, I had a distant relative that lived in Iraq a couple of years ago who had both of his kidneys, they had failed. And if you know, you know, if your kidneys fail, you have to go to the hospital every couple of days and undergo the dialysis treatment because your kidneys don't work. One day I met with him. You know what he said? He said, Sayyid, this dialysis treatment is so painful that to me, wallahi, the happiest person on earth is the one who has healthy kidneys. He says, if you have healthy kidneys and you don't have to go to the dialysis, then you are the happiest person on earth. Don't complain. Don't complain if your kidneys work. So basically he is saying that when you have some of the ni'am, brothers and sisters, we don't appreciate them. One of the ni'am, I spoke about this a couple of nights, is sahha. When we have sahha, when we have health, we don't appreciate it. The one that has lost sahha knows how important it is. So he told me the one who doesn't have to go through dialysis, this is the happiest person on earth, they should never complain because you don't know what I go through, Sayyid. Every single week, twice, I have to go to the hospital. This is what sometimes these sicknesses, may Allah protect us all from these sicknesses. If Allah has given you health, don't complain about what you don't have. Thank Allah that you're healthy. You don't have to go to the hospital every couple of days. You don't have to undergo this pain. My great uncle, Sayyid Muhammad Rada al-Qazwini, my grandfather's brother, he died of cancer. As he was going under... Uh, undergoing the chemotherapy. And I've heard that chemotherapy is also very painful for so many people. You know, to them, it is better to die than to undergo the pain of chemotherapy. I visited him, I think, two months or a month before he died. And you can see how much he was fatigued and in pain. And you can see how he was aging so much faster because of the chemotherapy. He said this one day when we were visiting him. He said, every day I die 50 times because of the pain that I am in. Every day, it's as if I'm dying every single day because of the pain of the cancer, because of the tumor that he had, because of the, of the chemotherapy that he had. Wallahi, when I heard that, I said, Alhamdulillah. No matter how many problems I have, at least I have health. This is a ni'mah that we underappreciate. So Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam says, Ilahi wa kam min abdin amsa wa asbaha saqeeman muja'a. How many people, they have to go through pain, but alhamdulillah, I don't have pain. Yes, I have the problem of Musa al-Hadi, but at least I don't have pain. This is number one. Number two, the Imam mentions a second type of problem that he did not have. He thanks Allah for it. He says, Ilahi wa kammin abdin amsa wa asbaha khaifan. How many individuals they have to leave, they have to live in fear. They do not know will they live until tomorrow or not. Like where? Look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, correct? Look at what's happening in Ukraine. Many of the people living in those cities, they don't know if they'll wake up tomorrow or there's a missile that will fight that will. You know, land on their houses and their kids will die. Look at what's happening in Yemen, brothers and sisters. Any second you see for the last couple of years. You don't know if you will live or you will die. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal that you live in a country that you have safety. This is one of the greatest na'am that we take advantage. Once again, the famous hadith says, Ni'matan majhulatan as Wal aman. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal that we have aman, that we have safety here, brothers and sisters. It's so safe at the middle of the night. I can go walk and I'm not afraid of my life. And Imam Al-Kadhim salam says, Ya Allah, I thank you for this. That I don't, I don't fear for my life right now. Yes, there is a plot against me, but at least right now, Alhamdulillah, I am safe. And then the Imam moves to number three. How many people, he says, Asbaha wa kamman abdan asbaha wa amsa fi sujoon. How many people, they are trapped in the dungeons of the zalimeen. They don't know when they will die. As I speak, brothers and sisters, you know, there are many young believers, followers of Ahlul Bayt that are in the dungeons of Al Saud and Al Khalifa. They don't know when they will die. Every day they wake up and they think today is the last day. You saw what happened last month. They didn't even tell their family members. They took them all of a sudden by surprise and they executed all these innocent individuals. And their family members know nothing about them. Will they live? Will they die? There's many people, brothers and sisters, that have to go 
they have to undergo this fear. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal that I live in a safe society. I have freedom. Wallahi, it is a na'mah to live in this country. Sometimes we forget the na'mah. We take up. We take it for granted, the na'mah of living in this country, in Canada, as the alhamdulillah, you have the freedom to do what you want. You have the freedom to say what you want. Just living here in Canada, you should be th so thankful. Wallahi, I shouldn't be complain if I live in this country because it's safe and I have freedom of speech. I have freedom of religion. I have freedom to do whatever I want. You saw, this, you, you saw the video a couple of weeks ago, what happened in Peshawar, correct? How they went into the masjid and they killed all these innocent people because they're there to pray. Alhamdulillah, in this country, I don't fear for this. Isn't this a na'mah that I have to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for? This is number three, Imam Al-Kadhim speaks about in Dua al joshan al -Sair. Number four, the Imam speaks about poverty. The Imam says, and how many individuals, how many people at night they sleep and they don't know where they will get their meal tomorrow. How many individuals, they go hungry and thirsty. They do not know how to make their living. They do not know if they will have food the next day or not. Like in Yemen, look at the famine in Yemen, brothers and sisters. You know, there's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam where he says, لا همك هم الدين. There is nothing that stresses you and depresses you like what? Like when you have to bear a debt. If I don't have a debt, the Imam says, thank Allah Azza wa Jal. Thank Allah infinitely that I don't have a debt. Because the fact that you have to repay a debt, sometimes this what? Sometimes this destroys your life. The hem, the stress, the agony that comes with it. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal, brothers and sisters, that here in this country come during iftar time and see all the different food that's extra that we don't appreciate anymore. That so many people would die to have this food. Isn't this a ni'mah, brothers and sisters? I was in one of the Muslim countries a few months ago. I won't mention the Muslim country. So I took a taxi ride. It was one of those low-income you know, immigrants that come from the Far East. So I had a conversation with him. I asked him this question. I asked him, what is your dream in your life? What's your dream? You know what he told me? He told me, my dream in my life is to go to Canada. Wallahi, this is what he said. My dream in my life is to go to Canada. Why? Because I heard there I can make $20 an hour. And in the country that he is working as a taxi, he makes $2 an hour. His dream is to come to Canada. Every single one of you here is living the dream of millions of people. And we still complain to Allah Azza wa Jal. So Imam al-Sadiq says, ila man huwa dunaka fil Look at the people that have less than you. You will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, much, much more. Look at what's happening in Lebanon, brothers and sisters. I read a couple of months ago, the average salary of a Lebanese worker. You know how much it is? One month because of their currency collapse. You know how much it is? $35. $35! They work an entire month. And me... If I make 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour, I see this as a little. I want more and more and more. Brothers and sisters, let's be more appreciative of the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us so much ni'am being here in this country. Wallahi, if you live in this country, you have so much ni'am. I spoke about sickness, right? That one of the greatest ni'am of Allah is health. And as long as you have health, then thank Allah. You say, what if I'm sick? Even if you're sick in this country, thank Allah. Why? Because it is much better to be sick in Canada than to be sick in Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan or Pakistan or India, isn't it? Alhamdulillah, every single one of you here has free health care. You have the best hospitals in the world. You have the best doctors in the world. You have the best medicine in the world. Alhamdulillah, you see the vaccine crisis? It showed, this COVID showed the disparities in the world. When I used to travel to some parts in the Middle East, I would see people, they would say, you're so lucky, Sayyid, that you live in the U.S. You have access to the vaccines. We don't have access to the vaccine. We have to wait and see our family members die one after the other. We don't have this. Isn't this a na'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought me to this country? The vaccine is so abundant. I remember in the U.S. I would read stories that some of the pharmacies had to throw away the vaccines because people didn't want to take it. And there's other people that are dying for it. That they are willing to travel to distant countries and spend thousands of dollars just to get one shot of Pfizer. 
And so many of us, we don't even see this. We overlook this. So Imam al-Sadiq says, لا تنظر إلى من هو عفواً. He says, انظر إلى من هو دونك في المقدرة فإن ذلك أقنع لعيشك Because this teaches you to become what? قنوع To become more content with your life. So this is the first strategy of Imam al-Sadiq. And then the second strategy of Imam al-Sadiq, he says, وَلَا تَنظُرْ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ فَوْقَكَ فِي الْمَقْدِرَةِ Number one, look at the ones that are what? Are less than you. Because you will thank Allah for all the ni'am. Number two, don't look at those that have more than you. And this is unfortunately one of the bad habits. That no matter how much we own, no matter how much we have, we like to see what others have that we don't have. We like to see those that are richer than us, that are better looking than us, that have a better life than us. What does this do? This makes you discontent with your own life. Even if you have the best life, you won't enjoy it because he has a better life than me. You go and buy a brand new Camry that so many people would love buying a Camry, correct? But then you hear your friend bought a Lexus. But will you like the Camry anymore? Now you want the Lexus because what? Because the nafs is greedy. If you buy the Lexus, you will see someone else went and bought the Lamborghini. It doesn't end. So do not look at those that what? That have a better life than you because you will not be happy with your life. And you know what's making us unhappy today? What's adding to the discontent and misery of our mental health today? Social media. Because before, the only people I know is you, the people that live in my block in my city, correct? Now I know millions of people. There's people that have 10,000 friends, 50,000 friends, and then they just go and befriend people that don't, they don't even know. And there's this tendency that we follow the accounts of rich people, of wealthy people, successful people, good-looking people. What does this do to us? It makes you less content with your life. You see, for example, you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, you know, in the morning when we wake up, first thing, we scroll through our Facebook. You see that one of people in the world or one of your friends, he's taken a flight and he's going to, for example, Paris. Wow, with the Eiffel Tower and I'm just sitting on the toilet in my house. <laughs> what does this teach you? To not appreciate the na'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. And then you scroll and you see someone, you think you have a nice body, wow, look at this guy's six pack. No, I have to go more to the gym. It makes you more discontent. It takes away the happiness from our lives. And there are studies that prove this, you know. I've read studies that prove individuals who follow the accounts of successful people, wealthy people, correct? they become less content with their own success. He's still successful, mashallah, he's making $20,000 a month. But he follows the accounts of that rich guy who what? Who owns a yacht, who owns a private jet. He's not going to want the $20,000 anymore. He's not going to like it anymore. And likewise, studies have proven that the individuals who follow the accounts of good looking, and it's not necessarily good looking, but people who appear, I'll get to this, to be good looking, they're no longer happy with their own body. Why? Because now, brothers and sisters, when you follow people on social media and you see some of the girls, mashallah, how beautiful, some of the men, the beautiful body, correct? And then you look at your body and you say, la ilaha illallah, la hawla wa quwwata illa billah. Correct? Many times you find that this is all photoshopped. I'm sure you know more about this than I do. The other day someone sent me a video of this new filter movement. Filter. They show you a picture of a of a woman you think she's Hur al -Ain, correct? And then she is explaining, and then she says that, don't be fooled, this is all a filter. She removes the filter, and then, wal-iyadu billah, you can't even look at her anymore. The Hur al -Ain turns into a jinn. This is all one what? All one filter. So this is all Photoshop. So don't believe what you see on social media. Likewise, if someone, that huge chick's back. Do I know this is true or no? We don't know. Before, if a woman wanted to, you know, change her looks for the better, she would have to go and pay thousands of dollars and get what? Cosmetic surgeries, correct? She would have to go through cosmetic surgeries, which reminds me of a story I read a couple of years ago. A man in Hong Kong, you can Google it, you'll find it. It's a very funny but true story. A man in Hong Kong married a very beautiful woman, very beautiful so they get married and then they have a child. The father, the man says, I noticed the child is very ugly. He doesn't take after his mother. What's going on? He said, as you know, I swallowed it. Sukat it, bila'ata, as we say. I didn't say anything. He says, our next child comes. He's even uglier than the first one. What's going on? I'm good looking. The mother is good looking. Where's the law of genetics? 
He says, when the third child came, that was the nail in the coffin. Aslan, I could not even look at him, how ugly. And this is the father saying this. So he says, I knew something is fishy. He says, I started to research the history of my wife before marriage. And I was able to find a picture of my wife when she was in high school in her yearbook. He says that when you see her picture, she was hideous. May Allah not show you her. Aslan, you cannot believe it's the same human being. I realized she had spent $100,000 on cosmetic surgeries. Now she looks beautiful. The problem with cosmetic surgeries is only you benefit, right? Your children don't benefit from it. Your children go back to your original face that you had before the cosmetic surgeries. And that's why the story says, not only did he divorce her, Wallahi, this is a true story I read. Not only did he divorce her, now he filed a lawsuit against her and he wants hundreds of thousands of dollars because she damaged his what? His mental health. And she what? And she gave him ugly children. So the point is before, if you wanted to change your looks, you what? You just spend a couple of thousand dollars. And now it's free. Now with the filters, brothers and sisters, you can make any person look like the most beautiful individual. So what we do is we follow on, face, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on I don't know, TikTok, on Snapchat, and we see all these beautiful lives. What is this doing to us? This is making us less happy with our own lives because we see their lives are nice, exciting, my life is boring, I don't want my life. Even though my life is so nice, it's so good. But because I focus on other people's lives, I fail in realizing that I have a good life. And this is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He is narrated saying, مَن نَظَرَ إِلَى مَا فِي أَيْدِ النَّاسِ طَالَ حُزْنُهُ if you make it a habit to see what Muhammad bought and where Ali went and which dress Zainab bought and where she went for lunch and dinner and where they traveled and which vacation and which resort and blah, 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 and this and that. He says, This will lead you to living a life of depression, a life of what? Of discontent. So what do you do? So don't follow these accounts, random accounts, just because it looks good. Because this is going to have a negative effect on you. So Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, لا تنظر إلى من هو فوقك في المقدرة. Don't look at those that have more than you because this will make you become discontent in your life. Al Imam Zain al Abidin has a beautiful line in Dua Abu Hamza al Thamali. Dua Abu Hamza al Thamali, the last line of Dua Abu Hamza. It's very long, correct? Towards the end, we doze off. But if you stay focused, the last line of Dua Abu Hamza al Thamali, what does the Imam say? He says, وَرَضِّنِي مِنَ الْعَيْشِ مَا قَسَمْتَلِي some people, they say, Ya Allah, in order for me to be satisfied, I want this, I want that, I want $200,000 salary, I want a big house, I want a big... Right? They want all these things to be happy. And Imam Zain al abidin says, you don't need any of that. He says, just ask Allah to make you happy with whatever you have. Instead of telling Allah to give you things so that you become happy, tell Allah to make you happy with whatever you have. Allah can do that. This is the most beautiful dua. Give me content so that whatever I have, I can thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it and I can appreciate it. And as I said, brothers and sisters, if you just look around in your life, you will find so many ni'am that you were unaware of. You know, someone told me during this pandemic, he says, I discovered some ni'am that I was never aware of during this pandemic. He says, for example, I discovered what a true gem my mother is. Because before COVID, I'm so busy and I don't really get to sit down with my mother and father. COVID, I was stuck with my parents in the house. I notice what a hard worker she is. I notice how sincere she is. I notice how much she loves me and how much she takes care of me. I notice what a gem my mother is. I would never see this. Always complaining, why don't I have this? He says, I notice my mother is the greatest mother of anyone that I know in the community. But this is something I overlook. Other people, they realize what? That they have such a good spouse. Other people, they realize they have good children because before COVID, it was all work, 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 study, study, study. The father doesn't even know the children. The mother doesn't even know their kids. COVID gave us, a, gave us an opportunity to discover the personalities of our children. These are na'am that we usually overlook because I'm busy looking at other people. I don't even see my kids. 
Allah has given us so much na'am, brothers and sisters, but we fail in looking at them, we fail in realizing them, and we fail in thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam al-Kadhim tells us that no matter how life, how difficult your life may be, know that Allah has given you so many other na'am that you shouldn't complain about what you don't have, but you should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of the ni'am. فَاجْعَلْنِي لِأَنْعُمِكَ أَوْ لِنَعْمَائِكَ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ وَلِآلَائِكَ مِنَ الذَّاكِرِينَ What a beautiful dua. And you see Imam al-Kadhim himself. Finally, when Harun came, Imam al-Kadhim was placed in the dungeons of Harun. It was not a normal prison, it was a dungeon, it was a grave. It was a grave in the middle of the earth, dark. The imam could barely even breathe in it. He could not tell the difference between night and day. This was the prison of Harun. We read in the ziyara, Al-Mu'adhabi fi qa'r al-sujoon wa dhulam al matamir It is a deep dungeon of Harun that you cannot even tell night from day. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim, you know, even when he was in those dungeons, he never complained to Allah. In fact, he thanked Allah. You know what he said? The hadith says that Sheikh Al Mufid narrates this that when he saw the dungeon of Harun in prison, instead of complaining, Why, Ya Allah, how am I going to get over this? He thanked Allah. He said, Allahumma inna ka ta'lam anni kuntu qad sa'altuka an tu farrighni li ibadatika wa qad fa'alt. Instead of seeing it as torture, as evil, he saw it as an opportunity. He said, Ya Allah, I had always asked you to give me free time for ibadah. Sometimes you don't have free time for ibadah. And now I see that you have given me the best opportunity for me to worship you. Because what is the imam going to do in the prison? There's no one to come see him. There's no one, nothing to do, no family, no companions. So he saw it as an opportunity to do ibadah. That's why the imam would be in constant ibadah. They used to come, they see him sujood. They come after one hour sujood, after two hours sujood. So he saw it as an opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see how you change your perspective to be content in life? Instead of seeing some of the things that we think are evil in life as bad, no, see them in a good light. See them as an opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to be closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all, accept our a'mal. I ask Him to guide us, to give us the ability and the tawfiq that we can learn these beautiful lessons from Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam and from the rest of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. Allahumma ajjil li waliyik al faraj. واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي لهم جميعا ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلوات